Our next speaker, I always love introducing Simon. I never know what's going to come out of my mouth when I open it. <laughs> um, Simon's a, uh, he's a polymath. He knows a little bit, a lot, about so many different things and so many different people and so many different aspects of our industry, which is also a community. And so Simon, as the director for the National Avalanche Center, with a huge, deep reservoir of experience, he's going to talk to us about what the Avalanche Centers do, what the forecast platform is, and um, some things that you might not understand or think about in the whole forecast environment. So, pleasure to introduce you and have you here at Wysoft finally, Simon. Um, just fun facts to know and tell, Simon was, Simon grew up in Lander, Wyoming. So, welcome Simon, glad to have you. Thanks, and uh, for those of you that were here yesterday, Nice to sort of see you again and everybody else. Thanks for having me. And I'm going to Lander tomorrow, so I'm pretty fired up. Uh, falls nice over there. So this presentation, unfortunately for you all, is another one that's not actually going to talk about snow. It's more going to talk about the or avalanche forecasting for that matter. It's going to kind of talk more about the programs and um, systems that are in place behind the public forecasting, public backcountry forecasting um, that you all see in the United States. So I work for something called the National Avalanche Center and it's a forest service program. We're based out of uh, Washington, D.C. Luckily, I don't have to live in Washington, D.C. or even go there very often. Um, although I did go there a couple years ago and I was kind of shocked and amazed at how much fun I had and how interesting the place is in terms of both history and the museums and a variety of other things that are going on there. Um, but needless to say, I live up in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, there's three of us that work at the NAC. Uh, my colleague Chris Lundy, uh, who many of you probably know, works and lives out of Stanley, Idaho. And uh, Bex Hodgetts uh, is a central Coloradan. And the NAC has two main programs. One is uh, guiding and overseeing the Avalanche Center program that we're going to talk about today. And the other is working with ski areas in the Army on uh, the military artillery for Avalanche Control Program. We've got uh, howitzers at seven different ski areas in the US. So that's kind of what we do. So in essence, I think you could think of the NAC as an umbrella organization for avalanche centers in the US. So today, we're gonna to talk about just a little bit of background about like, like why we even do this work. We'll look a little bit really quickly into avalanche center history. Look at avalanche centers today. We'll talk about something that we call the National Avalanche Forecast Platform that is, uh, that's now online and becoming kind of more uh, visible and almost ubiquitous within the group. And we'll talk a little bit about whether or not it works and, um, and what, what we're doing well, but what we can do better. So simply, you know, we, the reason that we're all here today and the reason that these programs do the work that they do is that people die in avalanches. And, uh, you know, this is basically the red lines running average through time. But basically what you can see is that from um, the early 50s to today, there's been a couple, couple jumps or spikes in avalanche fatalities in the US. And uh, each of those two main jumps correspond uh, pretty significantly with uh, changes in technology and access. So the first one is kind of like better ski gear, more people being interested in, in, uh, in skiing and climbing in the 70s. Um, and we see a jump in, in recreational fatalities, it kind of levels off and then all of a sudden you see another big jump and that's like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, all of a sudden we have bigger skis, really nice sleds, um, and we see kind of, you know, a 
according jump. And then interesting, you see, interestingly, you see that, um, you know, there's some noise in there, but it kind of flattens out in the last 30 years. The other thing I would say about this is, so, you know, if, if, if we average this out right now, we're looking at about 25 people in the United States a year that get killed, um, and another 10 to 15 in Canada. Um, what we don't track, and what I wish we could track, because the, the impact is quite large, is there's at least that many people, but probably twice that many people that get seriously injured every year, and we don't have good numbers on that. Um, and in many cases, those, are, those injuries are, are life-changing. Um, so even though we're looking at relatively small numbers, you know, like if you think about what's going on in Ukraine, 30 people here doesn't seem like much, frankly. Um, opioid e epidemic doesn't seem like much. But this is a pretty small community. Um, there's not that many people in the United States that actually expose themselves to avalanche hazard. And so the community's small. I think these, these relatively small numbers of fatalities have a really big impact that we don't understand that well, or, or actually we probably understand it, but we haven't been able to illustrate or visualize it very well yet. Um, but the other thing, and the thing that I'll leave you with on this slide, is that um, at least at this time in our history, almost all of these deaths are recreationally based. Like people are choosing to expose themselves to this hazard, which means that we have an opportunity to change behavior and potentially prevent um, these deaths. You know, I'm, I'm always skeptical when I hear people talking about like zero avalanche fatalities, like that's, that's a high bar. But I think we could get pretty close and I think we're actually doing a pretty good job and I'll talk about it at the end, but we are having an impact on, uh, on these trends. So, why is the Forest Service involved in, uh, in avalanche forecasting, or avalanches in general? And um, I've been asked this a lot in the last month, because um, as some of you probably know, the Forest Service is going through some budget issues. Um, they're looking for things to cut, but the, uh, the reality is, is like, avalanches kill more people on public land than any other natural hazard. And almost all of those deaths are on Forest Service land. And the Avalanche program today is the largest public safety program in the Forest Service outside of fire. The two things probably shouldn't be uh, compared. It's almost laughable, like one, probably one bathroom trailer at a fire is, we could run the whole Avalanche program for a year. But either way, we're very visible. We're fairly small in the scope of, of the agency, but our reach and our visibility is actually quite large. So this is just a, just a quick comparison. You know, we have that same uh, fatality graph on the left, and then on the right, what you're looking at there is, is when the different avalanche centers in the US came online. And what you see is they started, they started appearing as we, avalanche centers as we know them today, um, you know, you really start seeing them show up in the 70s at that first jump. You know, they're a direct response. It's an organic response to tragedy that's happening in communities, frankly. And um, so you see the first ones, you know, most generally were larger cities, so Seattle, Salt Lake, and Denver. Um, but interestingly, Bridger Teton uh, is the first Forest Service Avalanche Center to, to, like, be recognizable as we know it today. And then over the next couple decades, um, you see the rest of them kind of come online. And we haven't had a new avalanche center for them in, in, in quite some time. At least not within the Forest Service. There's been several nonprofit centers that have shown up. So today, there are, you know, the count is, fun. Don made a funny comment yesterday. He's like, well, I've heard 21, I've heard 25, and honestly, I don't even know how many there are because the way that you count centers is a little odd. But if you... If you count the Alaska Avalanche Information Center, which is a nonprofit in Alaska, as one center, then there's 23 in the country. And 14 of those are the Forest Service. One of those is the state of Colorado. And the remaining eight are nonprofits. Uh, those numbers are a little um, potentially misleading in the sense if you break those numbers down into like the percentage of area covered, 
you'll see that the Forest Service centers cover, you know, about 85, 80, probably 80 percent of the land mass in the U.S. The state's another um, significant percentage, and then the nonprofits are actually quite small if you start looking at like how much area they actually cover. But overall, uh, it's just under 90,000 square miles. So even though we don't forecast in the U.S. for every mountain range and every piece of avalanche terrain in the country, there is a significant amount of coverage. It's huge. You know, you've, there's operations in New Hampshire all the way to, to Colorado, to California, to the northwest and up into Alaska. So it's a, it's a highly diverse group spread over an uh, incredibly large land mass. And one of the things that's really important is this decentralized nature of each one. So if you think of that previous graph and how, you know, over 30 years these organizations started, um, the, lo the locality, both in terms of funding and control, each center is independent, historically. And um, that's really cool in a lot of ways. Um, largely because of community buy-in, uh, but it also creates a lot of problems downstream when you try and like uh, bring people together or make decisions on, say, what products look like. So today, generally, um, I think one of the things to remember is avalanche centers come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, everything from co covering entire states, in some cases multiple states, to focusing on really small, um, really small zone that's somewhere in between, like a mountain scale and a regional scale. Uh, everywhere from $100,000 budgets a year up to multi-million dollar budgets a year. So there's there are really a lot of different animals um, combined within that group of 23. But in general, the mission, at least within the Forest Service, is to provide information education, and that's everything from forecasting and data collection to you know, maintaining facilities, equipment, and reporting on accidents. And a really important point, and actually a really neat thing about the way that we do this in the United States is that every single agency avalanche center, both at the state and the federal level, every single one of them is a public-private partnership where the agency um, provides a certain amount of funding and a certain amount of support and provides the jobs. And the community provides uh, fundraising and outreach and basically supports that initiative. Um, so these aren't just like federal programs. These are community programs in many cases supported by the feds and vice versa, uh, which is both sometimes um, it's tricky bedfellows sometimes, but where it works well, it's, it's really neat because you can harness the power of the agency and the stability of the agency and you can combine that with kind of the nimble nature of a private enterprise, which is really important for the work that we do. And I kind of just went through this, but in, in general, if you're just thinking about the model, you know, the agency's in charge of operations and forecasting and the nonprofits deal with outreach and fundraising. So, what we just went through is like the big picture idea, but in reality, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot going on, and a lot of different operations and a lot of different communities and a lot of different resources out there that um, all try to need to work together in some way to provide uh, an understandable picture to the public uh, and an understandable picture to the profession, like what is our job and what do we do? Um, so that's a big part of my job and a big part of the National Avalanche Center's job is to figure out ways to tie this very diverse group, what has historically been a diverse group, together. And so one of the ways that we do that, the most foundational way, is through avalanche.org. Um, in 2016, we made a kind of an agreement with the American Avalanche Association to take that website and turn it into something that's just fundamentally based on backcountry public forecasting in the U.S. So we simplified the website and focused entirely on forecasting. And it has been an awesome partnership and um, 
you know, those of you that aren't A3 members or don't know anything about A3, I think this is, this is one of the best initiatives they have. I'm biased, but they, they do an amazing job uh, facilitating the work we do behind the scenes. And so it started out just as this kind of central hub. And if you look at it just, you know, face value, you're like, yeah, oh, it's got a map and it's got some information, like how hard could it be? But imagine if every one of those um, series of polygons is a different operation, say 20 to 25 different partners, and every one of them is using different technology, and every one of them has uh, a different product, and maybe a different time that they publish that product, and maybe even a different timeline upon which they publish that product. Um, making that interactive map work was frankly borderline uh, maddening. And um, so in 2019, we created a working group of all the avalanche centers and some others. And we started working on this idea of how can, how can we work within the, the uh, frameworks that we have, but harness the workflow behind the scenes into one central location. So we can create a space for avalanche centers to basically build the products that they need, but those products, one, we achieve consistency, two, we like share costs, and three, we get together and provide a way that like these entities and this professional group can collaborate functionally. And um, so anyway, we built this thing. And we launched it in 2019. We've been working on it the last couple of years, and now it's in its finished state, as much as finished as web technology ever really gets. Um, but today, all of the avalanche centers in the, in the United States use the forecast platform in some fashion to do something. Um, this season, 20 of 23 of these centers will actually use it to create their forecasts and other, other products. Um, it covers about 60% of the area in the U.S. And um, one of the most important thing, and I think one of the reasons it's successful, is it was built in a modular fashion. So basically, we have these, you know, five tools that we offer, but we're not telling people they have to use them. And frankly, if they want to use one and not the other, that's fine with us. And so it's been really successful in the sense that it gives uh, independent operations a choice in the work that they do. And I'll just buzz through this, but basically it's, it's kind of a common interface these days with web applications where you have database in the background, you've got this API that shuttles information both directions, and you've got a workspace for forecasters and a mini application that runs on independent websites to show whatever product it is that the forecaster's building. And so that piece is really key in the success of this thing. So what we've done is created a system that works behind the scenes that allows forecasters to build the products that they build and the public to access those products. Um, but the public doesn't even know. Like it's happening behind the scenes, it's coming through the, the local website. And that's a really good marriage because it, it, it keeps the autonomy and the community buy-in, um, but allows us to save a lot of time and money behind the scenes. And so today, in addition to those databases powering um, this national map, so now everything that comes into that map comes out of one database, so it's made our lives much easier. Um, we're running things like this, which is like homepage danger maps on different avalanche centers, uh, the forecast itself, observation pages, and weather stations, et cetera, et cetera. So for perspective, this is just for last season, and um, even though I've been doing this for a while, when we collated this stuff last spring, um, it really, like I feel like I should know how much work is being done on a given season, but seeing these numbers and seeing them come out of a central place surprised even me. So if you think about this stuff, like just on the AFP alone, over 10,000 forecasts, independent, unique forecasts in the United States. Um, over 2,000 forecaster observations, so that's 2,000 field days. 2,000 days people were in avalanche terrain doing this work. Um, another almost 5,000 public observations, which we can think of as volunteer time, which is remarkable. Um, 
almost 4,000 documented avalanches, and that doesn't count D1s. It doesn't call, count small avalanches, only avalanches big enough to be hazardous to people. That's kind of remarkable. Um, <laughs> a ton of photos. And then over 1,500 mountain weather stations moved through that system as well. So, like, what's really cool for me to see this is it, it's given us a way to snapshot the work that is getting done nationwide. Uh, and it's, it's a lot. So, this is a bit of a sales pitch slide I stole from Chris that he had for <laughs> <laughs> at a uh, presentation a little bit ago, but really, at the end of the day, this thing is pretty neat because it, it fosters collaboration, it improves our consistency of our, of our products, and uh, it really reduces the cost. Like, we're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year collectively by doing it this way. Um, and maybe at the end of the day, most importantly, it's centralizing our data, which allows us to learn from the work that we do and to improve. Um, I should say that in terms of cost to develop this thing, um, the government, federal government, Forest Service has paid for 95% of the, the development money that went into this. And so what the avalanche centers do is they simply pay for the cost of maintaining and upkeeping the system. So that's what we're doing. The program's on an upswing, things look good. But does avalanche forecasting work? And I alluded to this a little bit uh, in the first slide. But what you're looking at here is um, basically what this, is, what this graph is showing is that use in the backcountry, which we can think of as exposure to avalanche hazard, has increased dramatically in the last 30 years. And we all know this. We experience it every day. During that time, even though we're still averaging 25, 30 people a year, those numbers have stayed pretty flat in 30 years. So what that means is that the rate of fatalities is actually static or dropping, or the rate is, is dropping. So if the numbers are static, the rate of fatalities drops. And that's a really good thing. Um, in fact, it's in some ways remarkable. Like we would expect at this this comparison we're looking at over 200 fatalities a winter if we were seeing people die at the same rate as they were dying in 2000, 2010. Um, is that just avalanche forecasts? Probably not. It's just a piece of it, right? So what are the other things that could, could lead to a decreased rate of fatalities? Anybody? Technology, absolutely. Better safety gear. Right? Better communication gear. What else? Absolutely. Education is, is absolutely paramount and huge. And, and, and we do a pretty good job, I think, right now in this country of educating people. It's kind of a big deal. Um, so I, I believe it's the trifecta of those three things that really leads to success in this regard. What can we do better? Um, that analysis I just showed you, while positive, it's national in scope. It's not looking at specific areas, and there's places in this country, if we ran the same analysis on a smaller piece of terrain, we'd see a different picture. So, like, we have places, one of them is close to here, I-15 corridor, where we have, a, we have a problem. We have an education problem, we have an information, lack of information problem, and we have people a very specific type of person dying in that area. Um, so we need to figure out how to expand our operations and expand our resource base and basically replicate what we've done um, in places like Jackson, Ketchum and Bozeman, Salt Lake, uh, Seattle. We need to figure out how to replicate that in more rural areas in some cases. Uh, but maybe more importantly, places in the West that are growing really fast and we're starting to see um, patterns in accidents. And um, that is great timing because I'm largely done.
love it when that happens. Yeah, two minute warning, Simon. Oh, I'm done. Um, you guys think he has a big job? Yeah. Thanks, Simon. We really appreciate what you do. Appreciate you. Well, appreciate each other. Um, <laughs> that's kind of cute. Should we get a room? Um, no, no, oh, wait, did I say that? Um, we got enough time for a question or two for Simon. Who has a question? No questions for Simon? Yes, I oh, wait. New Mexico? Why is it New Mexico on Simon's chart on the map? I may have inadvertently cut it out of the picture somehow. There's a small avalanche center in Taos that's nonprofit. Um, they have not succeeded in kind of engaging successfully with Forest Service, but it's a small organization there. Um, New Mexico is interesting, like tons of terrain, ephemeral snowpack. Um, haven't seen, there's definitely a small clusters around Taos, but other than that, uh, fatalities are few and far between. Which I think is a really interesting thing, like places where it doesn't snow much. That's an interesting question. Doesn't mean that it can't benefit from information, but does it, should we be putting forecasts, like daily forecasts out in places like that, or should we think of a different model? I don't know. I th think I saw another. Yeah. Question for you, Simon. The question is, out of the 23 avalanche centers, there was three not using the NAC format template. What centers was that? And is there, uh, is there changes that need to happen to the template for them to start using that template? Or, or what are some of the reasons that they're using to keep what they're currently using? I think the, the simple, so, so one of those centers is um, the CAIC, State of Colorado. And they're, they're a different organization and they have different, frankly, different needs. Um, and they have a lot of resources and so they run their own technology package. But we work very closely with them behind the scenes. And so our databases can talk to one another. So like they send us their information and it populates the map, for example. And we've also done a lot of work with them in the last couple of years where we share forecast guidance on how we think about you know, assigning dangers and avalanche problems and all this other stuff. And we also share, um, at least at the final product, we share a design. And so, so that's pretty, pretty seamless. The other two are the, uh, the UAC, the Utah Avalanche Center, and the Gallup National Forest Avalanche Center. And both of those entities, they just have, they have different, uh, different products and they're happy with those products. And, um, so they feel, they feel like to, to serve their communities, um, at least for now, uh, they're gonna stick with what they have. Um, but both of those centers do use the platforms in, in one way or another. You know, they just, they just have a different outlook on forecasting. Anything else? Thanks everybody. Oh, oh maybe, maybe one more. So in the earlier presentation, there was a discussion about whether or not the, the, the five scale was the right scale, <laughs> you know, high and extreme. And I just thought it was really interesting because it seems like the previous presenter was suggesting that those high and extreme should be blended. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts are. And if there was a change to the scale, would it be you guys who would make that decision? I'll do this really quick because I know I'm out of time. Um, that is a great question. Hopefully we have a presentation on it next year at Wysaw. And um, the short answer is that I think it's complicated. We need to, there is a working group that is the National Avalanche Center, the state of Colorado, uh, Parks Canada, Avalanche Canada, and Pascal who gave the presentation. And um, there's work to be done to get to that answer. That's a, that's a great final question. <clears throat> yeah, stay tuned. <laughs>